Could I ask everybody to uh, take their seats? We're about to get started with this program. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS for external relations. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the center today and to this uh, terrific series that we are doing in partnership uh, with Louisiana State University's uh, Stevenson Disaster Management Institute. That's the acronym is SDMI. And everybody knows the LSU acronym because it's LSU. Um, we are CSIS, so we're going to throw a lot of acronyms at you today. Um, this is an ongoing series and partnership that we have with uh, uh, LSU and also with the Pennington Foundation. We have the CEO of the Pennington Foundation here with us today. Lori, are you around? There's Lori Bertman right here who really helped us get this series started with her vision um, for uh, a, a new series in Washington. This is the first of its kind that looks at disasters and emergency response in an ongoing basis. This is something we do basically monthly. And I hope all of you will be subscribed to um, our, uh, our list so we can give you updates as to when the next uh, series are going to be going on. Um, I also want to say that this, this event and all of our series will, you can find at uh, CSIS.org, our website, uh, if you want to see the replay, and we'll have transcripts up as well. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, my good friend Tom Anderson of LSU's SDMI. Um, Tom is going to give you a quick update on what's going on uh, with the flooding of the Mississippi River and what, how uh, Louisiana is looking at this uh, disaster and how the Armored Corps of Engineers and, and the uh, state government and the locals are uh, addressing this issue. Many of you have seen uh, reports on CNN and, and other networks uh, where the levees are cresting. Uh, this is serious business, and we can, you know, there was the first reported death from the flood uh, just the other day. But Tom will fill you in um, on what's going on uh, up to the minute because he's been getting updates from his colleagues down south. We're actually lucky that our friends from LSU could make it up here today because many of them are back uh, home um, trying to work on this crisis as we speak. We also have a terrific panel today. Um, Dan Rundy, my colleague, uh, is going to moderate it. Uh, and uh, I thank all of you for coming here today. And with that, Tom, please come up and uh, give us an update. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> it really is an honor to be working with CSIS on these very critical issues that we're facing in the world today. And I want to not only thank Andrew and the team at CSIS, but I'd also like to uh, thank Stacy White because she worked on this panel, just was not able to be with us this evening, but she's done a great job. But I also want to publicly thank um, the leadership of Lori Bertman as well. Um, she continues to be one of the great innovative thinkers in disaster philanthropy. And she's been a great colleague and mentor. And I can't say enough how much and how important it has been with her leadership to have the success of our institute and of this series. And thank you, Lori. I've been asked to make a <clears throat> very few brief remarks about the current situation in Louisiana and the ongoing Mississippi River flood. But I would be remiss not to mention how our hearts and prayers are with the people of Joplin, Missouri at this time, after their city was just ravaged by tornadoes. Last night, just weeks after a very similar cell of tornadoes ripped through Alabama. And in case it was missed in the deluge of news last night, tornadoes also hit Kansas and Minnesota. As you already know from the press, <clears throat> the Mississippi River flood is at historic levels, not seen since the great flood of 1927. And many actions have been taken to mitigate and respond to this situation. For Louisiana, the Bonnie Carey Spillway, just north of New Orleans, and the Morganza Spillway, just north of Baton Rouge, have both been managed and opened by the Army Corps of Engineers and are currently actually reducing the height of the river and actually achieving slightly better results than we had hoped for. This is um, very encouraging news. I will say, though, that had these two spillways not been opened, there is absolutely no question in anyone's mind that both Baton Rouge and LSU and New Orleans would already be underwater. So to the Army Corps of Engineers, we are very grateful. 
but there are still some significant economic challenges. These water levels and navigational changes that happen in the river due to the changed currents, as well as risk to levees by runaway barges have reduced shipping and resupply for manufacturing along the Mississippi. And on Saturday, Baton Rouge experienced a number of barges, one containing hazardous materials, hitting the Mississippi River Bridge in Baton Rouge and sinking stopping all barge traffic on the Mississippi River. And as of my being here now, it is still stopped while they try to dig those barges up out of the water. The uh, Bonacary and the Morganza openings have also impacted fisheries and oyster beds and the salinity in the water. But they're not only affecting the uh, fisheries and manufacturing, but there are also all the families and small businesses who live in the Morganza Spillway area where the Mississippi River overflow is now being directed towards Morgan City. Uh, the people and businesses have been evacuated and protective actions have been taken and continue to be taken until the river subsides back to normal levels, which we hope will happen sometime in July or August. So this is a very long-term event. And in the meantime, while the water is being managed, it's putting in a very lot of pressure on those levees those precious levees all the way down the system. But there's also a critical cultural impact that I just want to draw your attention to very briefly, and that's um, that this Morganza spillway and the water heading down towards Morgan City is at the very heart of Cajun country in Louisiana, which is already still reeling from the BP oil spill and from Katrina. But I'm very proud to report that in response to this flood, Louisiana has activated its highly innovative and brand new Business Emergency Operations Center, housed at the SDMI Disaster Lab at LSU, along with our partners in the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and the Department of Economic Development and the University of Louisiana Lafayette. This business EOC, just to explain it very briefly, uh, and why it's so innovative is a gathering of all the trade association leadership from the state, from oil and gas and manufacturing to bankers, restaurants, and retail stores. And on Friday, there was a briefing directly from the Army Corps of Engineers leadership and the Coast Guard to the business community, and it led to very productive conversations uh, and information sharing both ways, which was the outcome we'd all hoped for. But in closing, um, at the risk of underscoring the obvious, um, I want to just state a couple of things that, uh, like Andrew said, that we have noted in Louisiana over the years. <clears throat> Globally, over 3 billion people live within 200 kilometers of a coastline. And that figure is expected to double over the next couple of decades. And these water systems and other natural resources have historically been the very engines of local and global economic activity. And these are the locations where enormous investments have been made by our governments and industry and where our societies have built these towns. However, because these populations and infrastructures are growing at such an incredible rate along these natural opportunity zones, we continue to see higher costs for response and recovery from natural and man-made disasters. And with these needs increasing, we are also seeing the very real possibility of a future with scarcer capacities and resources due to the global economic realities. And even harder to discuss, we see real public fatigue growing about the size, cost, and recurrence of disasters around the globe. And so the question is, will this somehow move this conversation from the right-hand side of the problem to the left-hand side of the problem? And how will these trends not only affect the economic challenges, but the humanitarian ones as well? And during my lifetime, I was taught that the greatest threat and foreign policy challenge was nuclear war. And it coined a doctrine called mutually assured destruction. And I would ask this terrific panel here tonight if they would agree that we might consider the possibility that the greatest national threat and foreign policy challenge for this new century may be whether we can build a truly economically resilient world built upon a new universal doctrine of mutually assured survival. I thank the panel for being with us tonight and for the leadership of CSIS and for your kindness for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for those remarks. We appreciate it. 
Um, we're here to talk about the economics of disaster prevention and measuring the costs and benefits of disaster risk reduction. And the panel has formed around the, uh, a report that was published by both the World Bank and the United Nations called Natural Hazards and Unnatural Disasters. And I think you'll hear from Olivia, Olivier Mahoul, who was one of the, the contributors to the report. And then you're going to hear some responses from uh, Charles Setchell, Shabar Safi, and Rod Snyder. Um, Charles is with USAID, Shabar Safi is with, with FEMA, and then Rod Snyder is with the, uh, with the American Red Cross. Uh, I think that uh, everyone would agree that uh, the, the, the discussion around natural hazards has been um, a topic of increasing salience over the last five or six years. Uh, there's been any number of disasters that have cost hundreds of billions of dollars, and so the discussion around prevention and the, the payoff of prevention and the cost-benefit analysis of prevention uh, is a particularly salient and important one, and uh, each of the panelists have thought about these issues. Uh, and there'll be a number of uh, challenges, I think, that'll be, that'll be brought up. One will be around the issue of, is it called Build Back Better, Build Back, or Build Back Stronger? Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll have a discussion about that as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over the, uh, the discussion to Olivier. Olivier. Okay, thank you, Daniel, and again, thank you for inviting us, inviting me, in fact, this evening to talk about this, um, this topic. As, as you said, as Daniel said, I'm uh, one of the contributors of the, uh, of the report, joint report, as you mentioned, by World Bank UN, with many other uh, contributors uh, about the economics of effective prevention. And my contribution, particularly to this report, was on the financial side uh, uh, on how to help uh, countries uh, uh, before disaster strikes, in fact, to have the kind of right financial instruments to respond quickly uh, and to some extent to complement what the uh, international community can, can provide. And we started the discussion slightly early, um, having in mind that one of the key issues for governments is first not only the kind of emergency phase, but also the uh, reconstruction and recovery phase. Anyway, one of the key um, issues I'd like to discuss to, with you today is to uh, go back to the rationale of why the World Bank uh, got involved in this topic uh, and also uh, give you a kind of very simple illustrative examples, practical example on how we try to use the cost-benefit analysis to guide decision makers when it comes to investment in, uh, in, in risk reduction. So we're all familiar with these kind of uh, graphs showing the incidence on the impact of, of disaster, which are clearly increasing. And this is something, again, we keep repeating to our audience because sometimes we tend to, uh, we tend to forget uh, not only the kind of social impact, uh, which is always disastrous, but also the economic impact uh, uh, of, of, of natural disasters. Uh, and again, with the concentration of facets and population in high-risk areas, in addition to any kind of impact of climate change, we can expect in the future having more and more disasters. Uh, one thing i like to emphasize here is, again, the impact of increased uh, risk exposure in countries like Asia, particularly South Asia, where we can see a big growth, more than 10% a year in some of the countries. Uh, the, 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 the economic impact and social impact of disaster will be, will be much bigger in the future than it was in the past, in, at least in terms of economic, in terms of economic sense, and we need to, they need to be prepared uh, for this kind of major event. Uh, the, 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 the relevance of uh, disaster risk management at the bank, in fact, I would say, uh, started not too long ago. Um, the initial mandate of the bank, uh, I would say even IBRD, which is one of the entities within the World Bank Group, and means uh, uh, International Bank on Reconstruction and Development. And just the, 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 the title itself says exactly what we're supposed to do. We, our mandate is to help countries to rebuild to some extent or to recover, to reconstruct after disasters. The World Bank itself is not involved in emergency assistance, which is clearly the mandate of the UN. And we have to be very careful on how we define our comparative advantage here. Uh, what I like to show here on this graph is that as said here, about 10% uh, of the World Bank Group's portfolio is related to disasters. I must say most of them is post-disaster reconstruction. 
but more and more we can see projects where we help countries to prevent disasters, to help them to invest in some physical investments before the disaster strikes. It could be major investments, let's say in Vietnam, where we're helping government to build dikes uh, to protect against floods, and could be much smaller investments at the community level to help the, the communities to be better prepared in case of, uh, of a disaster. But the key point I'd like to make here is that within the big institutions of the World Bank, our senior management is getting more and more aware of the, of, the, of the needs to think before the disaster, and we try also to, to pass that to our clients. And again, we keep receiving more and more requests from our clients to help them to think about disaster before this kind of major events occur. Uh, one of the main drivers within the World Bank Group has been the uh, Global Facility for Disaster Recovery and Reconstruction, GFDRR, which is a multi-donor multi -donor trust fund, as we call, with about 30 uh, uh, countries and institutions involved in that. And the World Bank is just hosting that. It's not a World Bank tool. It's just a tool uh, set up by many donors, about 30 countries, as I said, again, to help countries to be better prepared when it comes to uh, disasters. And one of the main uh, components of this, of this program is about uh, disaster reduction. And this is exactly, I think, where uh, the economic of disaster prevention comes uh, into the picture. Uh, let me give you now a kind of um, short illustrative example, which is not exactly in the report you, you mentioned, Daniel, but I think it's a nice concrete example on how we apprehend the uh, cost-benefit analysis, how we use it, and what are the challenges we're facing when it comes to use this kind of tool to guide public decision-making on disaster risk reduction. And the example I'd like, to, co I'd like to, 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 to illustrate here is about a project we started a couple of years ago in Colombia, Bogota, which, uh, as you may know, is highly exposed to uh, natural disasters, and particularly earthquake. We've, we've had a kind of ongoing dialogue with the bank and other uh, uh, institutions like the Inter-American Development Bank, helping this country really to be better prepared in case of major disasters. I said earthquake, I could also say now floods, as you may know, uh, 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 um, um, Colombia was exposed, I mean, w faced some major floods even, even last year and even more, more recently. So they faced major, major uh, uh, disasters. Uh, the project I like to highlight and then show you how we use uh, cost benefit analysis is in the city, in the capital city, Bogota. It's a five year risk mitigation project. It's not a big project by itself, it's about $160 million. Half of that being financed by the World Bank and half of that being financed by the government. And the, the key, I would say, actions uh, under this project, in fact, is outlined in the city's 10-year plan, which is about risk identification, risk reduction, risk prevention and awareness, and financial coverage. So within this project, we're trying to, to tackle all these issues. And first of all, the risk identification. You can manage well what you can, what you can really assess well. So the very first step was really to help government to better understand the risks using some uh, uh, risk modeling techniques, which are well known, I would say, in the insurance industry, but not so well known in the, I would say, government uh, uh, environment. So the first, um, the first step was to use these tools, first of all, to sensitize governments about the impact of disasters, not by showing just hazard maps like the one you have here, but also to show them the risk maps, the economic impact. What could be the major impact of a 100-year event, earthquake event in, in Bogota? And what will the impact, economic impact, fiscal impact, social impact, human impact? And then how we can uh, try to reduce this kind of uh, uh, impact by having some ex-ante uh, uh, prevention uh, activities. To do so, we did some very, very basic uh, cost-benefit uh, ratios. Um, and again, really to try to sensitize government, but also to some extent to help them to prioritize. So the issue we're trying to do here was to identify key schools, key hospitals, key fire stations, we, the government should first retrofit. We all agree that in the longer term, all schools, all hospitals, all fire stations should be uh, strengthened. But in a five-year plan with $200 million, or a little bit less than that, what are our priorities? So the idea was to try to come up with a, a kind of efficient, effective plan, in fact, to, uh, to invest this, uh, this, uh, this money. And the, the challenge we, we faced here, which I think we're going to discuss later when we talk about cost-benefit ratio, is what are the benefits and what are the costs? In that case, the costs are well known. This is more or less the cost of retrofitting or uh, strengthening the buildings. But what are the benefits? 
Are we talking about purely economic benefits? How can we take into account the social benefits, the number of lives we can save in this kind of uh, activities? And also, uh, these benefits are highly, I would say, uh, uncertain. You're going to really have benefits if you have a disaster. Now, how can you convince a mayor in a city to invest uh, uh, against an event that could happen one every hundred years? These politicians, of course, have very short-term view elections. So you need to, 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 to have a dialogue within this kind of short time frame, which always doesn't fit well with this kind of longer term uh, uh, social benefits that such investments will, uh, will create. So it's, it's, it's challenging, and uh, this is where we have to, uh, uh, we have to be a bit, um, I would say, uh, clever to present that in a way that they may benefit from this kind of investments within the five years. In other words, the kind of questions, or, yeah, questions we got from these uh, uh, politicians are, what is my electoral benefits of investing in this kind of uh, uh, re in, in retrofitting buildings? Is it not better for me to build, I don't know, a subway or maybe just to paint the buildings? Why should I invest in, in some activities which are not always visible for uh, my potential uh, 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 voters? You know? So this is the kind of questions we need, to, uh, we need also to address when we, uh, when we deal with them. This is why usually when we talk about investments, going back to the slide, we talk not only about structural investments but also uh, functional investments. In other words, it's easier to convince a policy uh, maker to, inv to retrofit a school if at the same time you help them to just repaint the school and make the school look better because this is something that can be well visible. It looks obvious, but again, this is something that, which is quite important when we, uh, when, we, uh, when we discuss with them. So this kind of structural and functional investments really uh, go uh, work, in fact, together. One key um, uh, issue I was saying is that usually when we talk about cost-benefit analysis, we talk in expected terms. What is the average value, average benefits compared to the costs? Now, uh, the, the problem is that, again, as I said, the cost-benefit ratio can be almost zero if you don't face a disaster. If I invest in, if I retrofit a building, if within a kind of five-year period I don't face a disaster, it can be seen as a kind of money lost. So again, you need, to put the, you need to put that into perspective. One tool we've been more and more using in our projects is what we call probabilistic benefit-cost ratio, where we try to show, in fact, the, the risk profile of these investments, depending on the return period you have in mind. In other words, in this kind of project, we can say that every one to three years, you can expect a benefit cost ratio higher than one. So it's, it's a good investment for the mayor if he has a five-year horizon. And this benefit cost ratio, of course, will, be, will go higher if you consider higher return period, meaning kind of a, a bigger or a larger, larger disaster. So we've been using this tool, again, to sensitize the government, to tell them that it's not uh, we're talking about extreme events. When we talk about extreme events, working with the average value doesn't always make sense. And you need to, point, you need to weight that with the kind of probability of, uh, of occurrence of these kind of disasters. This is quite important because in the World Bank projects, one of the key, uh, I would say, analysis the World Bank board will ask in order to approve a project is what we call economic and financial analysis. We have to show them that this investment from the, world bank, from the country perspective makes sense. Uh, each country uh, in the three years got a kind of limited envelope of funds, I would say subsidized kind of access to credit to some extent. And we have to be very careful on how we allocate these funds. So particularly when it comes to prevention, we need to have a kind of strong argument to show to the, uh, to the, to the board of the World Bank as well as the country that these kind of investments make sense and can be compared with much more traditional investments like building roads. And, and in fact, it's, it's, you have to compete with this kind of project and to show that the, there is definitely high benefits in the, uh, there are high benefits in the, uh, in the short term. So uh, one thing I like to, to highlight just to, to conclude is, uh, again, this concept of dealing with uncertainty, dealing with a short term horizon for policymakers versus long term investment you have to make in terms of social investments related to natural disasters is something which is quite challenging. And again, any kind of economic and financial tool helping us to better sensitize and help decision makers uh, uh, will, be quite, uh, will be quite helpful. Again, we did it at the, at the margin. This is something that would be uh, further developed. And again, any kind of ideas, research projects related to that could be quite, uh, quite welcome from the World Bank perspective. Thank you, Olivier. The discussion about 
determining ca the calculus, the cost and benefit. There's a story in Japan about a small town mayor who built a massive tsunami wall and uh, for many years he was laughed at and um, he's now, you know, so there was this issue of this was built in the 70s and so if you I think about that graph in terms of the payoff of that tsunami wall was 35 years later but um, now he, he, that, that mayor is looking like a genius for having done that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's sort of that that sort of a calculus that political calculus and how do you how do you balance that as a, a particularly challenging one I think a universal one, uh, Charles uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Stacy White, wherever you be, may be, yes. for uh, inviting me, uh, extending the invitation. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you as well to SICE and LSU uh, for supporting this series, a very very important series of lectures. And last but not least, yourselves, the audience, thank you for showing up on this fine evening. I, I bear gifts. I don't know if you've seen the handout that I brought. Um, if that was circulated, um, we'll get to it in, in a few minutes, so maybe there's time to, to circulate if it hasn't come yet. Uh, briefly, um, I have 13 years of experience with USAID Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance as the Shelter, Settlements, and Hazard Mitigation Advisor. I've helped design uh, numerous projects, uh, shelter and otherwise, uh, uh, pretty much in all of the major disaster responses of the last 13 years and many of the smaller ones. Um, literally, um, we have sheltered millions, that's the good news, and the not so good news is that literally we've sheltered millions. Um, We've had a lot of uh, integration of DRR, disaster risk reduction, into those programs. We can go into some of that in a few minutes. Prior to that, I was an environmental and urban planner and housing economist, uh, both by degrees and uh, 20 plus years of experience, both here in the US uh, as well as abroad. Uh, I spent six years in Indonesia prior to coming on board with OFTA in 1998 and have been back to Indonesia several times since. Uh, tsunami, earthquakes, et cetera. And I think to give you an idea uh, of how dramatically times have changed and come full circle, in fact, when I arrived at Ofta in 1998, I was saddled with the somewhat onerous title of urban planning and urban disaster mitigation specialist, which apparently violated the U, urban, P, planning, and M, mitigation sections of humanitarian law, and was only muttered quietly in polite audiences. I changed my title after a few years of puzzled looks, but I'm now considering switching back from my current humanitarian friendly title back to that earlier UP and M focus. In light of the discovery, and I will say that again, discovery of urban areas, an increasingly dominant form of human settlement in these past few years, the emergent focus on mitigation and other forms of DRR, and the increasingly recognized need to guide future actions in human settlements through an informed process called planning. I wish my mom was still around to read the World Bank's report, believe it or not, for it places emphasis on an important game changer namely cities, and the need to develop governance processes and institutions to promote safer cities. If nothing else, it would have put to rest those long ago debates that mom and I had about whether or not I should pursue an urban planning degree. Wherever you are, mom, rest assured the World Bank has got my back. And I think, it, I want to digress a little bit, the, the uh, Rockefeller Center a few years ago, Bellagio Report, I think it was about four or five years ago, brought together UN Habitat, UNDP, World Bank, all kinds of different groups, uh, uh, organizations, and came to the conclusion that we're not producing enough professionals, development professionals, architects, engineers, planners, all of those types of folks that are needed to build human settlements. We have a, a major deficit facing a very large curve, growth curve. So we have a significant challenge. I'd like to focus attention on the use of economic analysis in our work at the U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, or OFTA, as it relates to both our response and DRR activities. 
For those of you unfamiliar with, with uh, OFTA, the, the mandate is, is very explicitly humanitarian. It's saving lives and reducing suffering and reducing the economic and social impacts of disasters. The last phrase of that mandate, which some of us call the third phrase, has been interpreted over time to mean efforts to reduce various forms of risk in disaster and crisis prone settlements. This is ranged from short, three, six, nine month interventions to longer term, three, five, seven year commitments to reduce risks in numerous sectors, including those associated directly with natural hazards, be they floods or fires or hurricanes or cyclones or earthquakes. And that list is fairly long, as you well know. Recent examples that I have been involved in directly include flood risk reduction, hurricane risk reduction, promotion of seismic resistant construction, and something I call Settlements Planning 101, basic urban planning as part of the disaster response effort. One of the, I hope, lasting legacies of our recent response and our ongoing response in Haiti is support of Haitian diaspora professionals, engineers, planners, architects, who have worked with various ministries, the Haiti uh, Interim uh, Reconstruction Commission and others to really help infuse a process of planning into the response and recovery effort. It's something that's sorely lacking. The, I, I talked to the Minister of Planning uh, when I was there uh, most recently and he said he had two trained urban planners on his staff, country of Haiti, two. Um, we quadrupled that with our diaspora program. Uh, the handout that was circulated is but one example uh, of many OFTA projects focused uh, in, on DRR. In this case, a small flood risk reduction project in Kinshasa, DRC, in the late 90s. It consisted of very small, a series of check dams in a watershed, a very affected watershed. Um, uh, there's a part of Kinshasa that is so vulnerable to flooding and watershed uh, erosion that it's called the islands. Um, the area is just so removed from the mainstream of the urban fabric because it's just situated on very highly erosive soils. So we went in with very small scale check dams uh, made of bamboo and grass and rock and all of those things. Um, it, I bring this to your attention because I think the, the, the intervention between uh, two very similar storm events really facilitated an economic analysis that we don't, as you were saying before, we, we sometimes don't know when the payoff is. This was very good in that uh, we eliminated a lot of uncertainties associated with valuing DRR costs and benefits because we had a time frame and cause and effect uncommon. So by adopting conservative assumptions and only accounting for direct economic losses, one dollar of our OFTA investment of taxpayer money in risk reduction resulted in a savings to the community, the affected communities of $46. That's not bad. That's not a bad turnaround. Um, this savings has occurred uh, up to the present time. We haven't gone back. Um, we've invested significantly elsewhere in DRC, but we haven't been had to go back to that particular area. And one of the important aspects, I think, of cost-benefit analysis is not just the numbers themselves and our return on investment and savings and what have you, but really how does it affect the affected community? The particular communities that we were working with in, in Kinshasa um, were, were very extremely poor communities and very vulnerable. And so our risk reduction measures resulted in a savings, a cumulative savings of about $425 uh, per family, or the equivalent of about half of annual household, average ha annual household income, thereby enabling those families to purchase food and clothing and medicine and other essential items that they may have had to forego had there been another flood event. So not only do we have costs and, uh, costs and benefits, but we have impacts and the implications of that investment. Again, I think another, uh, if there's such a thing, there's another beneficiary in this story, and that was OFDA. Um, we were able to husband our resources and apply them elsewhere. We repeated that success in Kinshasa elsewhere after floods uh, in subsequent years to great effect as well. We've had this significant return on investment, small scale investments in this case. 
And I think I, I w would like to say that an unintended benefit and something that we often don't pick up until later after we've done the formal review um, is, is really how, it, how our management of water in that watershed, the improved watershed management, really resulted in significant public health benefits as well. We found um, a significant reduction on the order of over 90% in the, in the incidence of cholera in the affected project area. Um, subsequent through better water management. We've seen it in places like Bamako, Mali, and, and uh, Nouakchott, and, and uh, N'Djamena, and other places where by just basic water management uh, uh, through a risk reduction uh, type of uh, intervention, we also have these s secondary impacts that are very, very positive. So more generally, OFTA has linked economics and DRR programmatically in recent years with the creation of a new sector called Economic Recovery and Market Systems, which focuses primarily on livelihoods and livelihood restoration. Some ERMS projects feature an input to DRR activities themselves, such as revegetating watersheds to promote both enhanced water uh, uh, retention and livestock recovery, and entail market assessments and an informal cost-benefit analysis uh, field-based. More generally still, I'd like to note that the World Bank's report on the, on the economics of effective prevention reminds us that CBA is a useful guide, quote unquote, but not the sole judge. Other factors should also be considered in making decisions. Thus, although the, the bank report promotes the science and business of CBA, cost-benefit analysis, so to speak, it also reminds us that there remains an element of art in CBA as well. How to judge the value of life, for example, is far more than mere economics, as the report recognizes, and I think correctly so. In closing, uh, I note at page 20 of the report that greater exposure need not increase vulnerability of cities, if cities are well managed. What does managed well mean in this regard? How will CBA be used to help define what well managed is? And this is not a trivial matter. Uh, a bit more than 50% of humanity lives in cities these days. Cities are, more dom are the dominant form of human settlement and will be for years and years to come. The current rate of urban growth, the equivalent of a city of 1.4 million people will emerge every week of every year for the next 20 years. It's a lot of people in cities. Further, one in six human beings currently lives in conditions depicted by the recent film Slumdog Millionaire. Everyone uh, probably has seen that movie. Uh, and current trends suggest that one in four humans will live in such conditions by 2030. We'll see uh, in the cities of developing countries where about 100% of future, in the next 20 years, uh, global population growth will be concentrated. Um, we'll see that doubling of population. We'll see a tripling of the footprint, the land footprint. That has implications for risk reduction um, at a very, very high level. And the great rise of cities and city slums will entail a lot of development decisions of all kinds at a level and pace we've never seen, often entailing considerations of hazard risk. We need plans for urban places that are not only aspirational and inspirational, but also very, very operational. Those of us in the humanitarian community would do well to not only highlight the need for D DRR in the coming years, but be an active partner in identifying and managing harm's way, those hazard prone areas that seem to draw more and more people over time so that human settlements of all sizes can be configured and reconfigured to increase safety and reduce the cost of poorly managed settlements. This will take a lot of work, of course. Missing, it seems, in a lot of current discussions is the need to promote the third R of risk reduction, resonance or amplification, through concerted efforts at managing development processes and promoting recovery after disasters that is neither simply build back or build back perfect, which seems to be a goal of many, but build back safely, build back stronger, build back better, build back however you want, but do it with DRR in mind. 
This effort will entail significant focus and resource application in support of governance programs that foster institution, community level, and professional capacity building. This is overlooked in the extreme at the current time. Perhaps equally important, the effort will require strategic communications programs to increase understanding of and demand for DRR. Let me repeat that, demand for DRR. As a centerpiece of development in humanitarian activities and not merely as a mainstreaming initiative. I think the World Bank report provides us with an insight in this regard, and for that, we should all be very grateful. Thank you for your time and patience. Shabar. Good afternoon. My name is Shabar Saifi. I work uh, within the mitigation programs at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, most of my time I'll spend on talking about how FEMA looks at benefit cost and what is the rigor applied to benefit cost analysis for mitigation projects and programs. But before I step into that realm, um, just to give you a general sense, uh, uh, with the number of natural disasters you hear about nowadays uh, through CNN, we call them CNN disasters because they make the declaration before the president gets a chance to declare the disaster. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of little disasters that happen in communities all the time, and FEMA responds to those disasters on a daily basis. At any given time, I would venture to guess there are more than 100 natural disasters FEMA is responding to throughout the year. Um, having said that, uh, just to now focus, FEMA does three big things. It does immediate response, it does recovery, and it funds mitigation. For a general ballpark figure, the way our grant programs are set up for response, recovery, and mitigation, beyond all the interactions you see in the media, uh, we give a lot of grants to communities and states to accomplish these objectives. And, and the fundamental approach we take is the community and the state has to evolve and develop these projects rather than the federal government and coming and telling you that you need a bigger bridge or a stronger house. We want the mitigation to be coming up from grassroots, from the community level, because community is in the best position to determine and the state government is in the best condition to determine what is appropriate mitigation actions, keeping in mind their hazards, their vulnerabilities, and the overall risk. In terms of dollars and cents, we are averaging in the last few years about a billion dollars in mitigation grants to communities and states every year. So that, that's a formula we apply based on how much assistance we provide for response and immediate recovery. We apply a multiplier to that and say, okay, this state gets X number of dollars and the multiplier generally is 15% of the total expenses FEMA incurs for a given disaster. Uh, having said that, mitigation includes a lot of things from our perspective. Uh, it includes good planning at the community level. We require communities to have mitigation plans that FEMA will review and approve because when disasters strike in that community or that state, we will encourage communities to use that plan as a basis for their mitigation strategy. So upfront thinking and planning, urban planning, development issues, building code issues, all those aspects are discussed by the community in those mitigation plans. And plans are obviously as good as how many people engage in the community in developing those plans. What is the definition of mitigation? FEMA's definition of mitigation is actions taken to reduce or eliminate, eliminate loss of life and damage to property. Uh, 
I will, I will delve into, uh, over the years uh, now, again, FEMA, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, the amount of people are staffing at FEMA is less than the staffing of a police department in any medium-sized town. Today, FEMA employs nationwide 5,000 people. That's how big FEMA is in terms of its staffing level, permanent staff. Um, so that's why one of the reasons we want communities to engage is because we are not going to be able to develop their plans for them. We are not going to be able to determine which projects are appropriate to fund. We are not going to be able to do benefit cost for every project they want us to fund. We want communities to do that. Now to empower a community to do that, we have to build useful tools, tools that are usable, and we don't need economists like at this table uh, to run those benefit costs. Uh, we don't need, because if we need economists to run benefit costs on every project we fund in a community, then the cost of analysis might be more than the cost of the project. Uh, keeping that principle in mind, we have built software tools. Right, Olivier? Um, like we have built software which can be used by a non-professional. You don't need an engineering background or economics background. You don't even need to be an expert at mitigation per se because these community officials on a day-to-day -day basis have different roles. They could be the mayor in a small town. They could be the building code official. It could be the city planner. These are the people coming together to play the role of figuring out what's the right mitigation for themselves. The tools we have built apply to various types of hazards, and they're specific to the hazards and the project types. Over the last 25 years, FEMA has been funding mitigation grants. We have a general idea of what kind of projects communities like to fund from a mitigation perspective. 80% of our disasters are related to floods. When a big hurricane comes, most of the damage is because of flooding. So we, we think flooding, we think wind, we break up a, a a hurricane into two pieces in terms of how we look at it. We look at wind damages, we look at flooding damages. Earthquakes, uh, tornado safe rooms, to tornado winds. Recently we've had amazing uh, incidences across the country uh, uh, on this issue and uh, uh, we have found with our experience over the years, safe rooms is truly the real mitigation solution to deal with tornadoes because when a tornado comes, the thing we want to worry about is not the home. We want to worry about the occupants. Because at 250 miles per hour wind conditions, most of the structures that our residences are built, the way they are built in America, would not survive. We typically have stick frame structures. We build houses with wood. The great houses to survive um, some, some amount of earthquake and some amount of wind because they're flexible. But when a tornado wind comes, it picks up everything. So uh, over the years, FEMA has funded about 20,000 safe rooms across the parts of the country where there is high probability. Um, and actually, these recent uh, unfortunate incidences have shown us that lives have been saved because of these tornadoes. We are focused on lives primarily when we talk about tornadoes. We are focused on lives when we primarily talk about earthquakes in terms of what we look at an appropriate level of reinforcement to a building or what kind of building to build to survive these type of disasters. When we talk about floods, uh, wildfire, we think as much about structures. Because, because for wildfires and for floods generally there is a good amount of warning for us to evacuate ourselves. So our concern is what can we do to minimize the impact on the structure and the built environment. Uh, at FEMA, uh, uh, you'll see in literature a lot of time people only talk about this, this principle and they use the phrase cost-benefit analysis. At FEMA, we call it, always call it benefit-cost analysis because our philosophy is we are really focused on the benefits of these actions and not as much the cost. And generally, a rule of thumb is once we go through that probabilistic calculation that Olivier talked about, uh, similar principles, uh, we look at a benefit-cost ratio if it's greater than one. So if the benefits over the life of the project are going to be greater or equal to the project cost in economic terms applying you know, various economic principles, then we determine the project to be cost effective. Once we determine to be the project to be cost effective and it's an appropriate mitigation project and meets, meets certain other requirements per the law, 
we say that project is eligible for funding. And as long as money is available in that grant program, those projects get funded. Um, there, there are various kind of damages we would potential damages we consider when we do the calculation for what the benefit is. Damage to the structure, damage to contents, loss of function, if there's a library, a school building, a courthouse. When those buildings are non-functional, there's a loss of function. There's a cost to community every day of that service not being available. So we incorporate that in our calculations. Displacement cost. My home is flooded. Um, I can't live in the home, so I have to go get a rental space or go live with my relatives. There's a cost. There's a cost society or the individual is paying for the displacement. We include those costs. Rental, if we are looking at mitigating a business, then we are looking at uh, uh, income loss for the business. Loss of services. Um, if the distribution system for power or water is damaged or we are mitigating one of those issues, for us not to get power or water to your given home, for there's a significant cost to society. The cost is not what your water bill is or electric electricity bill is. It's much more than that. It's more than $100 per day per person for electricity, for example. Economists have helped us come up with these numbers, which are average nationwide. Again, because we're operating in a US domestic environment, these, these are hard numbers we can work with. In the international environment, the challenges are, of course, very different because the cost of these services and value of these services are different in different societies and different economies. Casualties, we, we do unfortunately or fortunately assign a number to, to injuries, minor injuries, major injuries, and loss of life. It's significant, it's based on federal studies. That's the value uh, of a statistical life or a statistical injury, not my life or your life. Okay, I do speak a lot. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these slides, uh, um, and partly Olivia has talked about probability, uh, you know, some of those things, and the same principles apply. Uh, we are currently started a project to quantify benefits from environmental impacts. At this time, we do not know what is the value of saving salmon in a certain river because I move the house away from the banks of the river? So this is just a very uh, simple exam uh, an example of how we look at environmental benefits. And there are huge environmental elements that, so we have started some work in trying to see how we can quantify those benefits. And uh, we are working with expert economists that uh, you know, come from academia, industry, and uh, government. Talking about benefits, when you talk about benefits, you have to look at what is the life of a project. Olivia talked about the political life of a project is how long this guy is gonna get, have an opportunity to get reelected. Re we are looking at physical life of a project and doing benefit cost. So retrofitting a home, generally we say the life is 30 years. Because typical homes need significant renovation in every 30 years. So we have come up with these average numbers based on what engineers know about the life of these mitigation projects. Um, I have a few comments uh, in, the, in the international arena which are different from, um, from the domestic arena. Mitigation, mitigating the risk for people and not buildings to me seems to be more important in the international arena. Saving lives comes first. Um, um, because, because the infrastructure is a totally different ball game in the international arena. Lack of insurance creates other additional challenges in the international arena. I don't know how many of you know that is only there's the largest flood insurance company in this country is owned by the government, and there is only one, and FEMA runs that flood insurance program. Private insurance companies, most of them do not sell flood insurance. They, of course, sell on behalf of FEMA as a rider on your regular home insurance policies. The software we have, there are multiple versions of that, um, and this, the, the uniqueness of the software is it can be used by, in the international arena because it's a relationship between damage and frequency. So if you can quantify damage in terms of dollars, cents, rupees, euros, and you can assign a frequency to that given ev event, and 
you can run this benefit cost model. You don't need to know anything about the risk at that point specifically from a technical perspective. So it's basically a damage frequency relationship. You feed into the software and it'll do a benefit cost for you. It's independent of current series. It's independent of, uh, uh, you can adjust the interest rate, whatever value of you want to assign to the value of money calculations. Um, Shabar, I think we. I'm done. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Great. Thank you. Okay, Rod. Going last, uh, everyone steals my thunder anyways because I have very similar slides uh, to, to some of the other ones. Um, I first want to thank CSIS uh, for this event. Um, I also wear a hat where I'm the co-chair for the Interaction Disaster Risk Reduction Group. And we always look for opportunities to highlight disaster risk reduction and to move that agenda forward. So we think this discussion around cost-benefit analysis is really important. Um, and Tom, we would agree with you that most of the NGOs would, ha would agree that safer, more resilient communities is, is where we want to go with the future. And um, uh, one of the biggest impediments to development is disasters. They use a statistic that Hurricane Mitch set Honduras back 10 to 20 years on their development gains. So we definitely want to see disastrous reduction um, mainstreamed within um, development goals. Uh, so that's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, let me get this up. Dan alluded to acronyms, so I'll start with my title's acronyms. Cost-benefit analysis of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Throw some uh, uh, acronyms at you. I'm going to start off again uh, very similar to Olivier with disaster trends. Um, just a couple quick notes. Right now, there's about 250 million people affected yearly by disasters. 98% uh, of them are weather-related. Uh, Oxfam predicts that in five years, that's going to double by 50%, where the average population that will be affected by disasters is 375 million, which will completely overwhelm the, um, uh, the current humanitarian capacity. Uh, so we definitely see the, tr the, the, the trend going forward. Uh, some people would say that, that that could be just because we're getting better at reporting, um, but it's not. If you take some of these issues, just with peer population growth and urbanization, which, which Chuck alluded to, uh, we're going to see an increase in disasters. I, I often talk about that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in a growth business. Uh, disaster management is going to continue to grow quite rapidly just because of population growth and urbanization. Uh, I just heard a recent statistic by 2050. Right now, we're about a 50-50 global society, 50 living in rural areas, 50 living in, in an urban society. By 2050, that's going to be two-thirds of the people are going to live in, in urban settings. Um, and with the population growth, that's out of 9 million, 7 million are going to live in urban areas. And a lot of them are going to live in marginalized areas. They're going to live on floodplains. They're going to live on steep, steep slopes. Um, they're going to live in shabby housing. Uh, very similar to what we saw in Slumdog Millionaire. Um, so just, just that alone, we're going to have to deal with, uh, with more and more disasters. Uh, and I contend that the international community is not very good yet at working in urban, urban centers. And Katie is a good, a good wake-up call for, for what we need, where we need to go um, and get a lot better at it. These trends, these trends are only going to be exacerbated by climate change. Um, we're going to see an increase uh, in the frequency and the uh, intensity of disasters. Uh, and this is, and this is um, uh, really going to erode the ability of, of uh, households to, um, to cope. And what's interesting about climate change, what's going to happen is Right now, a lot of areas where we have disasters, you have historical knowledge. Climate change is going to change that. So right now, we have a hurricane belt, and a lot of the communities in that have, have hurricane experience. That hurricane belt's going to shift. We, we, we had a hurricane in Argentina a few years ago, had no idea what to do. The tornado belt could, could shift up. So it, not only is it dealing with more disasters, it's dealing with unpredictable disasters and not having a, a historical knowledge of that. 
And of course, most of the impacts of climate change and where disasters are um, impacted the most are in developing countries with vulnerable populations. And again, we're going to see this expounded with huge urbanization, urbanization growth into, um, into marginalized lands. And what we're seeing is that the, the, the regular disasters are increasing, and therefore that's eroding the capacity of the households to be able to become resilient. Uh, it's putting them in a spiral of, of poverty, and so we have to break out of that poverty. Getting to cost-benefit analysis, disaster preparedness works. We know this. Um, this is a good slide that proves we're getting much better at saving lives, um, but we're still having huge economic losses. Uh, we're, we're seeing this, this trend going down. I think some very stark examples give you of where preparedness works and where preparedness doesn't. Haiti versus Chile. Right after the Haiti earthquake, a month later, two months later, was the Chile earthquake. Very similar um, uh, magnitude, very similar density population, a very, a very a stark difference between uh, loss of life. Chile has a culture of preparedness, so preparedness does work. Um, I think the other good example is, is Japan and Aceh. Uh, the recent Japan tsunami hit a similar uh, band of uh, landmass as Aceh, um, but we had 20,000 loss of lives, which is, which is still huge, but with the, with the size of that tsunami, um, where in Aceh it was 200,000. So we, we know, just intuitively, disaster preparedness works. Um, what we got to get better at is, is doing cost-benefit analysis on what, what that works, and particularly in developing countries. I think we can use a lot of this financially modeling um, as examples, and, and I know FEMA sometimes uses a ratio of one to four. Um, every dollar spent saves four dollars in preparedness. Um, you see these different ratios rolling around, which are important because I think, I think we need to use those particularly to show donors and governments um, and, and, and businesses that investing in disaster prepared, preparedness works. But where I think we need to do that is translate that more at the, at the national and sub-district and local level. Really what, what is working and, and what with limited resources where, where is that best return and investment going to be? Because we have scarce resources and we have limited choice. So from the American Red Cross perspective, we, we work at the community level. And so I think a lot of what we heard today was, well, we heard some community stuff, but the, the report that came out from the World Bank is a really good, um, indicator that, again, preparedness and disaster risk reduction works, but it's at a very macro level. Um, where we're working is down at the community level. We see community uh, as the first responders. We often think we're the first responders, or even the Red Cross and country is the first responders. It's the community and your neighbor that's the first responder. So we have to give them the skills to be able to do that. And in a lot of developing countries, you just do, you do not have a fire department. You do not have a police department. You do not have the infrastructure to allow that. So it's the communities that really need to um, be prepared to do that. Um, and so we have a model that's called community-based disaster risk reduction, which is a participatory approach that walks the community through um, a, what we call a VCA, vulnerability capacity assessment. And most communities have capacity to be able to have action that reduces their risks. Um, and we, we take them through a process that helps them identify what their risks are, what their capacities are and what their vulnerabilities that then lead to action planning. Um, and then you can have, and then we do uh, first response training, we do first aid training, we do early warning, early evacuation. And these are all things that the community can, communities can do themselves. But what we're trying to do more of is put a cost benefit analysis model on that to help the communities to really look at what interventions are going to get, get the best return um, for their dollar. So what we're seeing is this, this model is being, being used to inform and evaluate a range of interventions. Um, it's a decision support tool to decide on the range of possible interventions to reduce risk and maximize, mac, mac, maximize benefit for every dollar. Give you an example. In Nepal, we were working with the community 
and they came up with a, a list of interventions they'd like to do. They wanted to build a bridge that gave them market access, plus, plus would be evacuation route. Um, they, they had drains that were clogged up, and so they wanted to clean those out and build better drains for, for flooding, and they wanted to look at riverbank um, uh, river uh, enforcement or, or improvement. And the community really wanted to do the bridge. They felt the most important thing was, was market access and they wanted a place to evacuate. But when we ran them through a cost-benefit model that actually looked at some of the social factors, it ended up being riverbank enforcement was the, what was going to um, be the most important because that protected their crops from being destroyed and annual, and annual flooding or flooding was increasing to an annual event. Um, and so when we put them through that, um, that modeling, they were able to actually put a, um, a, 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 it helped them make that decision where they would have made it another decision just, just based on intuitive um, discussion. Um, taking them through a CBA also then helps them go back to the government or go back to other NGOs and say, look, we, we've done this analysis, we've done this modeling, for this amount of investment we know we're going to get this return. So it's a great, it's a great model to, uh, to um, uh, use use for the government uh, and it, it takes the communities away from uh, just getting outputs um, to really looking at outcomes and this is a this is a, a, a good um, another advantage of the cost benefit analysis cost benefit analysis encourages an open discussion as well a lot of it's just taking people through the process it's not necessarily the end result but it's looking at options and putting some numbers numbers on that um, and so we're seeing through this participatory approach, um, it, it's helping communities have a conversation. However, there, there's challenges with this community-based approach. Um, one, it, it, it is a risk assessment, and so it's, it's a lot of opinion. Um, it's not based on empirical data. It, it's based on uh, local knowledge. And so that in itself is inherent throughout the process. Um, data collection is, is challenging. Uh, again, I would say in the United States, it's much easier to do cost-benefit analysis because there's a lot of secondary data um, that's already available and that's already been done to build on. In a developed country, you don't have any data. Um, and therefore, you're going to have bias, you're going to have conflicting and inconsistent information across the board. Um, and so this can, this can definitely skew your outcomes. Um, the C and it's not, it's not implemented systematically, so it's very hard to make comparisons across the board. So this, this may work in this community, but if you go to try it in this community, it might not necessarily work. So comparisons are very difficult. Um, and then social factors are hard to measure. I was in a recent um, presentation where an NGO was walking through their cost-benefit analysis, and they got hung up on, on valuating life. And it, and it really just, just, just stopped, it just because the discussion just, just stopped, because they just couldn't get past that, and it was, it was really hard. Um, and then social factors are, are just very, um, very difficult to uh, um, uh, measure and quantify. Some interesting things that have come out of this, though, is that um, what we have seen is when you put a cost-benefit analysis on some of these interventions, if they're tied to development, they, to they, they seem to have a, um, a better return for their money. So for an example, uh, boats in, uh, that are used for an evacuation, if those boats are rented out in non-disaster times, they, they generate income. Um, uh, evacuation centers are now often used as community centers. So they're, up, they're, up t they're maintained better, they're ready to go, so when evacuations hit, they're, they're used more. Um, and then I think another good example is uh, we've done a lot of um, market access. So not only does it, does it um, uh, uh, improve access to the markets, but it's an evacuation route. I did a project in Pakistan where, where up in the mountains, everything's done by trails, and, th and they can be really small. Just by widening that trail, it decreased the time to, um, to get to the market by almost two hours. Um, and then it was also easier access to get injured people down to, um, down to a uh, hospital. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm done. Um, and my last point is that we're seeing um, soft resilience uh, opposed to, or soft scale resili resilient measures opposed to um, hard. Cost benefit analysis is often attached to infrastructure projects or tangible things. 
But when we start putting it on soft things like early warning, um, training, we're seeing that there's a, a much better return and investment in, in a lot of these soft mitigation activities. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rod. I think we've heard uh, several messages today. It pays uh, for preparation does pay. Uh, we've also had a discussion about a spectrum of cost benefit analyses. We've had sort of, I've heard, we've sort of, sort of the community TurboTax version of uh, uh, cost benefit analysis to the much more sophisticated version that the World Bank provides to, to national and, and uh, subnational governments. Uh, but it sounds as if one of the challenges here is how do you build the capacity for communities, subnational governments, and national governments to to have the capacity for for resilience, for preparation, to make the to make um, rational choices, uh, and how do they balance that against a number of different uh, challenges? One was political. There's there's some discussion in the report about the politics of this, and um, there was some discussion in Olivier's comments about that in terms of how do you. Uh, if you've got a, a, such a long timeline, if, if we're talking 20 or 30 years before you see the benefits of, of, of an investment, what, what is the, what's the rational, uh, why, why, would a, why would policymakers make that decision if, if they, get, they get rewarded on a shorter term basis than that? And so it's a, that's a particular challenge, even though it's not a pleasant one to, to think about. Uh, and so I think there are any number of uh, different tools that have been discussed, but also uh, we've also uh, discussed ways in which communities and societies can can achieve resiliency. That there are, there is actually uh, that uh, that the reason the the work was done is that, that there's a belief that uh, we can actually um, see change happen in their societies that were discussed, whether it's Japan or or Chile, where you're talking about a culture of preparedness and how do you achieve a culture of preparedness. Um, maybe I am just cognizant of the time. I know we're going to have, uh, I want to make sure that we have some time for Q&A, but I'm just wondering if, if, if each of the, the, the panels could give a very brief, maybe a minute or less uh, comment on how do you create a culture of preparedness, if you could just give your, your views on that. Maybe I could start with Rod to, to speak, speak to that, and each of you could just go down the, down the aisle. It's a, it's a long-term process, and again, this is what DR, disaster risk reduction is often housed in humanitarian sections, but it's really a developmental issue, and it, and it takes a long time to build that culture. Uh, we see it a lot in schools as a good entry point, um, and where, where students are open to new ideas, and, and we see um, students as uh, change agents that often can take messages back to their uh, um, communities, and the Red Cross has a good entry point into, into the schools. Um, Shabar? Uh, yeah, I, I think I completely uh, concur with how, what Rod said. I think one way um, um, at an at a agency level, uh, on an organizational level, we do is we, we give out uh, uh, grants or we ourselves do a lot of outreach and education on the value of preparedness. So we have also built a lot of tools uh, that are available uh, for communities to use to, to go through the cycle of what it means to prepare at an individual level, at a community level, at the school level, what is the infrastructure that needs to be in place? So, yeah. Okay. Charles, uh, we have less a focus on on policy and codes and regulations. We try to develop um, uh, better building practice, for example, training. Um, with, with Red Cross, we've often in the past done um, multi-level types of training from uh, informal education in the street, uh, street theater, uh, puppetry, comic books, you name it, um, we try to do it. Um, and strategic communications at a more kind of uh, macro level. We've done a lot in the last year with uh, text messaging in Haiti. Um, that is trying to get some key, key messages across on DRR. I mean, from the World Bank perspective, there are two dimensions. One is at the institutional level, since our uh, uh, clients are governments, and I think it's a long-term effort really to, to build within the kind of policy-making decision process this kind of culture of preparedness, and there is a lot of work to be done. 
and in parallel doing some work at the, I would say, macro community level uh, through some livelihood projects where we can use comic books, where we can use short movies. Uh, and again, it's a long-term process. Uh, uh, and, and I think you need to build on both. It's kind of institutional aspects because you want that to be uh, uh, well institutionalized and as the same thing, you want to make sure that the, the, uh, at, the growth, uh, at, the, at the ground level, people uh, understand the needs to, uh, to some extent just to implement the rules and to apply or to comply with the rules that could come from the, uh, from the sample level. You have been very, very patient. I'm going to collect three questions uh, and if I'd ask you to tell me your name, your affiliation and a very brief question. So there's, uh, there are microphones. There's a gentleman here. And we'll start with the gentleman here, but we're going to capture three questions. Very briefly, Robert Schreiter, international investor. I wonder if you uh, couldn't uh, also educate or elicit the help of insurance companies, business, mm -hmm. and investment community on this. And my specific question is, for example, in the, in the case of the Japanese tsunami protection that lasted for 35 years, that's 35 years, or it should have been, of reduced risk premiums on insurance, not just for the for the town, but for every business, every residence in that town. I would think accumulatively that could make a strong argument for why there's money savings in doing these projects in the future. Yeah. Other other questions in the, from the audience, the gentleman uh, gentleman here. I'm uh, James Turner from the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I guess one of the things I'm a little bit surprised about is that I <coughs> haven't heard anybody talk about public edu risk education uh, in that uh, you know, very few in the public you know, understand what risk is, they understand the difference between 1 in 100, 1 in 10,000, uh, and, and what it may, may uh, mean. And also, to, uh, as you do these, some of these analyses, you know, to, to make sure that people understand that they're you know, that, that when you do this probabilistic calculation, it's not a, a number that you arrive at, but there are huge uncertainties around that, and maybe that will help you to, to rank order the relative risk. But, uh, but again, you know, if, if you could address risk education. Yeah. Okay, third question. Yeah. Third, third question. Gentleman there. Hello, my name is Sergio Lacambra. I work uh, for the Inter-American Development Bank. I have a question for Olivier. Um, uh, how useful is the uh, cost-benefit analysis tool for assessing um, uh, projects um, aimed at institutional strengthening or policy reform? I'm talking here not about you know the typical investment projects, but rather you know soft projects. Thank you. Why don't, I'm going to take these a little bit out of order. Maybe I would ask maybe Rod or perhaps Shabar to take the second question about public risk education. And maybe Rod, I suspect you, you could just speak, could you speak, speak to that and then I'll Shabar after you. It, it, it's tough. Um, public awareness campaigns sometimes work, sometimes they don't. Um, we are looking at in Almaty, for example, which is very uh, at risk to earthquakes, of doing a very intensive citywide uh, public awareness campaign. Um, again, we've, we feel it's, it's getting it down to the community level, and, and we do do risk analysis there and risk education. When we do our vulnerability assessment, the first thing that we work with the community on is taking them through their risk analysis. So we do do risk education at the community level. Um, in a lot of places, it's, it's difficult to do it nationally. Indonesia, for example, it's 17,000 countries and, I mean, 17,000 islands. Um, that's the size of, that size of New York. Um, I mean, the size of the U.S. from end to end. So it's, and it's got every hazard except locus, and I think it has that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Shabar, on the issue of risk education. Um, I'll just share some of the things FEMA does in terms of risk education. Uh, we approach risk education at the national level primarily in the context of flood disasters. Uh, I don't know if any of you all have seen those commercials of Flood Smart uh, where the water rises in a house and some of the good demonstrations out there on national television. We approach it that way. Uh, uh, 
at the community level, and we do a lot more community outreach and education post-disaster in the communities that have been impacted. And just to give you a specific, after a disaster, if 10 counties are declared as disaster areas, we will open at least one disaster recovery office in each community and homeowners and individuals and business owners, they all come in, they go through a process of education and what kind of support system and mechanisms are available through all the federal, the whole federal family, whether it's small business administration, whether it's FEMA, whether it's Red Cross, all these entities are sitting there. Uh, so, uh, and that's where we do a lot of the education in the context, context of that hazard and the mitigation uh, proposals. Charles and then Olivia, if you could each speak to the issue about insurance in the investment community. Sure, thank you. Uh, one experience that we've had uh, with the private sector and insurance companies in particular uh, has been um, in, in several countries in Southeast Asia of working very closely with them to develop uh, a series of building uh, practice uh, training programs um, that are tied to it's almost a precursor activity to uh, the establishment of, of insurance markets. Um, in Indonesia, for example, when I lived there years ago, I think 2% of the households in the country had some form of insurance. So it was, it was very much an emergent market kind of situation. So there, there had to be some, uh, some precursor activity of, of really promoting the higher bars of standards and what have you and standardization of materials, uh, building materials, construction materials and the like. We've had um, some very, very positive uh, contributions uh, from AmCham, the American Chamber of Commerce in, in various countries. Uh, Indonesia is probably the best example that I know of um, because the president was, was a good friend of mine for, for some time. Uh, also in Turkey and, and Central Asia, places that you wouldn't normally think would be a large uh, community. Uh, uh, there's, there's been a, a lot of support from the private sector um, not just the international community, but also the local community. I think uh, this, these issues of, of continuity of service, for example, in the local banking industries uh, and, and, and offices of, and the hotels and uh, industry, tourism industry, they're, they're looking at, uh, particularly with earthquakes, for example, they, they want to know how their, their services are going to continue. So th this issue of, uh, of critical kind of internal infrastructure as well as public infrastructure is something that's very, very keen. And I think people in the private sector have a, have a leg up in some regard in understanding the, the, the real true benefits and costs of that. And we'll, we try to incorporate those wherever we can into the, dis, dis, uh, the DRR program that we do uh, in places like Istanbul. Maybe if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, in fact, the two questions are, I would say, closely related. When we talk about disaster risk management at the bank, we tend to work on five pillars, one being institutional capacity building, the other one being risk assessment itself, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, risk reduction, and financial, uh, I would say, disaster risk financing. So I would not try to, uh, um, to, to, uh, to exclude one against the other. I think it's really kind of you need to work around the five pillars. And I would say it's the, the fives or nothing. It's not one or, or the other. On the insurance, just on the, on the insurance component, uh, this is something, I mean, coming from the financial sector myself in the, in, at the World Bank, this issue of public-private partnerships is quite important, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, um, um, risk assessment. Again, I think that to some extent, the insurance market can provide tools, if not products, but at least tools to help us to better price the risk. And I can take examples uh, related to earthquake or related to agriculture. When you can price the risk, it's a very good signal, economic signal you're going to send to your, uh, to, to your counterparts. Uh, they have developed, as I said in my presentation, they have developed tools uh, to help us to price these kind of risks. Uh, all these kind of catastrophic risk modeling techniques come from the insurance sector. Now, how can we use insurance to create the right incentives? This is something which is a bit tricky because in many countries, and the U.S. also, uh, insurance is not fairly priced, meaning that and if you take flood insurance, you know it's highly subsidized. So you do not always send the right signal for political reasons. So in many countries, it's very difficult for us to convince governments, first of all, to develop a property insurance market based on private, uh, uh, I would say, uh, principles, and also to let the market price the risk accordingly. The governments may always tend to come up with a kind of universal coverage at a universal price, with some cross-subsidies 
between that. So this is something again which is quite difficult to, uh, to tackle. We, have, we do have some successful examples like in Turkey uh, where the World Bank helped setting up the Turkish catastrophe insurance pool and this is one of the few programs in the world where your uh, premium will depend on your type of building and the location you live. But again they are quite, uh, quite, uh, quite unique. On the other hand uh, we've been working with the government of Romania and the government of Romania decided to commit with one single premium rate for all the country. So again, we need to work around this kind of uh, private incentives versus a kind of political economy dimension. Uh, quickly on the last yeah. point, institutional strengthening, as I was saying, this is of course where you can reach the limits of this kind of economic tools. And uh, from our side, uh, as I said in my presentation, we really focus on some physical investments where we think that cost-benefit analysis can provide uh, 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 some guidance, not being the final tool, but at, at least can provide some guidance. When it comes to soft investments, including institutional capacity building, from our side, I don't think we can really price it properly. The way, again, we sell it to our clients and to our board at the bank is that it comes within a package and if you have to invest in risk mitigation, physical risk mitigation, you also have to invest in, this, in, uh, in institutional uh, capacity building. One or the other is not really the alternative. I think uh, our time has ended. I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel.